Hey everyone, welcome to the Sword and Laser. I'm Veronica Belmont. And I'm Tom Mary. Kind of a turbulent ride today. Yeah, a little nauseous. Shuttle after ride. That. We need to fix the thrusters or something. Look into that limp. All right, it's time for another author's spotlight, and we need to be careful because we are shining our spotlight on an author who knows Chinese and plays with swords. And that is all the more reason you need to know these seven things about Max Gladstone. Max Gladstone went to Yale, where he wrote a short story that became a finalist in the Writers of the Future competition. He was nominated for the John W. Campbell Best New Writer Award in 2013. He has worked as a teacher, tour guide, freelance translator, industry analyst, and editor. He speaks Chinese and once lived in Anhui province in China. And he'll also probably correct my pronunciation of Anhui province in China. Most likely. Max has been accused of playing with swords. He says he doesn't have that many swords, and certainly not enough to deal with, you know, Scott Lynch or anything. Max likes single malt scotch, preferably Isle single malts. He has said his favorite is Lafroig 10. I like this man. And I like that you had to pronounce those words. <laughs> Max's first novel, Three Parts Dead, debuted in 2012. It tells the story of Tara, a junior associate in an international necromancy firm, hired to resurrect a dead fire god. When she investigates with the help of a chain-smoking priest, it's murder. At least she's pretty sure the god was murdered, and hence skullduggery ensues. Also, calamity. Max says his second novel, Two Serpents Rise, was partly inspired by the Gin Blossom song, Hey Jealousy, and the dry climates of Los Angeles. And Beijing. The world of Gladstone's two novels, The Craft Sequence, is inspired by the financial crisis of 2008. He has said Chapter 11 bankruptcy, with its cutting up and rewiring of dead or almost dead stuff, looks a lot like necromancy. That's one example of how magic stands in for the economy in his books. Okay, so there's a deposit in your account of Gladstone knowledge. Let's bolster it with some more insight on Max Gladstone in Aaron's whiteboard. One of the most common bits of advice given to aspiring writers is, Write what you know. You know what? That's terrible advice. If we were limited to writing what we know, we would never read anything speculative, progressive, fantastic, or unlike the humdrum of day-to-day -day existence. Thankfully, most actual authors recognize this trite phrase for what it is. Heck, even Aristotle, chief advocate of mimesis and champion of the theatrical verities, still recognized good literature was about more than the mundane. Instead, follow the advice of author Max Gladstone. When you're gonna write, aim big. It's clearly a sentiment he had in mind while embarking on his craft sequence of novels. It's a series built around necromantic lawyers collecting for dead gods. Not the work of someone interested in a slice-of-life novel about the daily commute. Now, you could argue that Gladstone is drawing on his own academic and professional experience in infrastructure and information systems research. After all, a religion is, amongst other things, a massive piece of infrastructure. But it's not just the major plot points, but the nitty-gritty of Gladstone's work which pegs him as a first-order fabulist. Steampunk aesthetics and a strong woman of color protagonist underscore the degree to which he has invested not merely in representing the world he personally experiences, but crafting worlds which could be. Also, he looks like he could play Doctor Who. When I pointed this out to my wife, she said, Witch Doctor. And so I said, Not a witch doctor, Doctor Who. <laughs> uh, I crack me up. <laughs> witch Doctor. Which doctor? I find that funny. That's a joke. Of course, make. I find that of funny. Of course, you find that funny. I think 14th Doctor, yeah? Yeah. After Capaldi? Yeah, why not? Why not? Why not? Well, you know what? All this means nothing if Max Gladstone doesn't exist, but thankfully, he does, and he's here with us now. Yes, thank you, Max, for joining us on the show. Thank you for having me, also. So let's, let's dive right into the craft sequence. Tell us what it's about. It's about basically the big business of necromancy. Um, Back in 2008, I came back from spending a little while in China when the economy started falling apart. And I had this weird feeling like I was in the middle of this kind of spiritual war, the kind of thing that happens in fantasy novels, you know? I would look around and I'd hear that there were, um, that there were these enormous entities that were sort of being destroyed or destroying themselves. And at the same time, there was nothing kind of physically, there was no physical damage that was happening. So I thought, wow. You know, you have basically these enormous immortal entities that are going to be going into battle and falling apart, and then we have other people who are coming in to sort of stitch them back together on the operating table and tell Igor to get cranking, and then they start sort of wandering around, chomping on brains and things like that. So, yes, 
We were talking about other examples of where magic and, and economics have crossed. And, I and think it has in the past. Lev Grossman, The Magicians, was one where we could think of. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it, there haven't been that many of them. Why do, why do you think that is, that nobody made that connection? I'm kind of as surprised by, as anyone else because it seems like a really logical jump to me. Magic is a form of power that is abstract, that like, the more you'd spend an awful lot of time and sort of spiritual energy generating it, it's often seen as corrupting, it's often seen as sort of forming the people who give their all in, their, in the pursuit of it into sort of strange beings. And I don't know, this is a lot of the same way that like a lot of popular culture views money, views economics, views pursuits like the law. You can get, um, you can get sucked into it, walk down a dark path. So. You know, if you take the Wolf of Wall Street and then you turn everybody into an immortal Lich King, this is basically what you end up with. And for me, the parallel is more like I, I understand about as much about economics as I do about magic. <laughs> so for me, it might as well be magic. Yeah, I think a lot point. of people. Yeah, that for me, ma math is hard. I'm like that math Barbie. I'm like, math is hard. I don't get it. I have to use like various complicated applications to figure out tips and stuff. But anyway, um, I digress. I actually have kind of a non sequitur question. And I, I was on your website. I was going to go into the werewolf of Wall Street, but we can oh, get to that. Oh, that's good. <laughs> All right, that's excellent. Good. See, it, it just like, sort of writes itself. Yeah, All right. exactly. I like that. Um, so we, we, we poked a little fun about Doctor Who, or Doctor Who earlier in the show. But I also noticed on your blog that you haven't written about it in maybe like three, four years or so. But you did mm -hmm. mention Sherlock and, and the new BBC Sherlock. Sherlock series. Um, I was wondering if you've been keeping up with the show, and if so, like, has, have your feelings changed about it? Have you become a fan? Um, and, and what you like about it, if you do? The BBC Sherlock series yeah. or Doctor Who? Or... BBC Sherlock. I am bad Sherlock fan in that I haven't yet watched the new episodes, even though they've been out in, in, uh, in the, the UK, UK for right. the last couple of weeks. I've been loving Sherlock, actually. I think it has remained a um, exciting and kind of fresh take on the characters. I really, really like Martin Freeman as Watson. Mm -hmm. um, and Benedict Cumberbatch, of course, is great as Sherlock, but Sherlock is this wonderful sort of larger than life character who most of the interpretations that I've seen get something about Sherlock right. What people miss all the time is Watson. You have sort of Watson as this like sort of doddering fool who's following around Sherlock and kind of pratfalling every few minutes that the, so that the adapters can get a laugh in. Whereas Watson's, he's a military man, he's a ladies man, he's this like cunning, cool angle on the entire Sherlock mythos. He just looks like he's not the smartest knife in the bag because, you know, Sherlock is going over here sort of laser destroying any enigma that he's coming into right. contact with. So I, I love Martin Freeman's portrayal of Watson in, in the new Sherlock series. I'm really excited to see the next season. I, I love the show, and uh, but, you know, I have to say that my favorite Watson, my favorite modern-day Watson is actually Lucy Liu on Elementary, which is a show I didn't think I would like, and then I started watching it, and I was like, this is actually pretty close like one of the closer interpretations to canon that I can find, like in terms of the original Arthur C uh, Arthur Conan Doyle stuff, and so I've I've been really enjoying that show. Excellent. I'll need to catch up on it. I really liked Lucy Liu in the the Lucky Number Eleven of all the silly things. She's playing a kind of Watson-ish character in that, huh. right? Like right. the person who's always a step or two ahead, or sort of following behind the mystery, but is like almost too smart for their own good. Well, we got some listener questions uh, from our Goodreads forum to ask you. And the first one comes from Charles, who writes, my question, you write a lot about gods. How do you, Max Gladstone, define what a god is? Just a small question. Just, you know, itty bitty. <laughs> I think he means in your writing, of course, just to yeah, narrow it down is, a little bit. That is the thing of which if someone asks you if you are one, you say yes, yes. right? Good, yes, exactly. In these books, gods are a, um, sort of network effect of human communities. You get a lot of people together and they start uh, sort of communicating with one another and believing in their existence as a community and that sort of network, that like spiritual network starts to display signs of consciousness, starts to talk back eventually and starts to communicate with other sort of emergent properties of other networks. And that's kind of what the spiritual dimension of these books um, comes from. There's, uh, if you think about like human consciousness, right? you can compare human consciousness is an emergent phenomenon of our biology if you're thinking about it in this very biological reductionist way right so you have um, electrical symbol signals and chemical interactions in our brain each one of which is pretty easy to describe but you put millions of them together constantly firing at you know 
like like supernovas moving through our, our neural pathways all at once. And consciousness happens. You get things that sort of think and, and breathe and dream. And I'm wonder I started wondering what if the same thing would happen with sort of social networks, with the kind of webs of engagement and, and interaction that economists talk about cities and talk about civilizations as being. Wouldn't those sorts of things kind of wake up? And then what would happen when they started to talk with the people who were part of them? And like communicating with your own cells. We're just the cells. We're the neurons yeah. in the larger consciousness. That's fascinating. I got so, a little shell shocked there. Yeah, you were imagining Google becoming like, a god. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that's a consideration, right? Right. right. The, the science fiction sort of community has taken these ideas in a lot of directions, talking about sort of um, talking about uh, technological networks waking up, like the internet wakes up and starts talking with people. It's some part of the plot of uh, of Neuromancer, for example. Right. Um, but. There are all sorts of other networks that aren't explicitly technological, but might still, in some way, have behavior, have personalities. We, we think about cities as having personalities, even though they're um, just, if you want to reduce it down to a certain level, a bunch of concrete and roads and, and buildings and stuff, none of which need to be in the place where they are. And yet, Los Angeles feels like Los Angeles. Boston feels like Boston. It's not just the climate. It's sort of everything that combines to make a, an entity that's as much of a person as any of us are, maybe. Yeah. No, that's that's a really cool way of thinking about it, actually. And people tend to identify you by the place you're from as if you share that personality. As you somehow have absorbed that sense too. of yeah. the right. place, or yeah, that's that's a really good way to put it. So this is a kind of a long question, but, but bear with us. Andy says, Max, in your Twitter profile, you say you're an occasional martial artist. Can you talk a little bit about what that means? Why occasional? What your martial arts background training is, what styles you have studied, and how, if at all, that background influences your writing. I'm a very nice martial artist, but only occasionally. Um, <laughs> I, I started doing martial arts, um, gosh, back when I was in grade school, and I moved around a lot when I was a kid. So there wasn't much of that time that a lot of martial arts styles really want you to put into like you know you've done 10 years in the style and now you're the grand master so i'd be doing a particular branch of karate in ohio we moved down to tennessee i started another branch of karate then i was like going off to college and doing so just kind of jumping from sub style to sub style to sub style and there were also different there are different ways that uh, certain martial arts styles make you think and make you feel um for me anyway like Shotokan Karate, which is sort of very straight, punches, kicks, blocks. It's what Ryu does in Street Fighter. Okay. Oh. Uh, except for no no fireballs. I was going to say no. Yeah, yeah. No, no Hadoukens. Probably. Hadouken! Yeah, maybe I just didn't get to that level. Yeah, uh, that's probably it. But that feels like very sort of logical step by step. I'm now going to do this block, and now I'm going to punch you back. And Whereas styles like Tai Chi, which I started doing later in Aikido, are a lot more about melding with other pers people's energies and redirecting them in particular ways. And then there's fencing, which, is, which I've been doing a lot of very recently and is really weird. It's like playing time travel chess with the other person. Oh. Um, I, only you both have swords, so maybe it's <laughs> like sword plus chess plus time travel. Where does, where does time the time travel, travel come in? When you get beyond the point where you're just extending your arm and putting the pointy end into the other guy, mm -hmm. um, the other guy gets, you start thinking about like, okay, if I'm going to, I have these three feet of steel, three and a half feet of steel or so. That means that there's a lot of space on which the other person can um, interact with my attack. If I'm just punching them, then there, you know, there's maybe a foot more or less that they have to like see what my hand is doing and try to, to block it or interact with it. So if I'm extending my sword, then all of a sudden there's like four feet or so if you count the arm and you count the, the actual blade. So there's a lot of space in there to play around, to like encourage someone to extend in a particular direction when they're overcommitted in that direction. Then you can, um, then you can either block or you can make an opposition, sort of redirecting them along another line and then taking it in. But then if they know that you know that, They'll be looking for you to try to do that to them, so they will start something that makes you respond in a certain way that then they can respond to in another way, which you weren't expecting. And then the higher you gotcha. get, the deeper you get into the sport, you start jumping further and further and further ahead in time. I had and no it's idea all happening like, like split seconds, too. Yeah. That's, 
because I took a little bit of fencing, and the thing I could never do is like, wait, but I'm still thinking about my move. <laughs> you, you've already stabbed me. Stop. Help, help, help. <laughs> yeah, no, there's, there's, there's this thing called the tactical wheel where it starts off with you're doing a direct attack, and then you're parrying the direct attack, and then it goes all the way around. There are a ton of steps and sub-steps, and then you get back to just direct attack again, or this, the solution to all of this incredibly complicated over the top, so you, you know, thinking. Can you skip all that like, thinking? Can you just skip that part and just stabby? Just be the stabby? Uh, just stabby gets you pretty far in the early stages of the sport, and then other people start taking advantage of And they start with the just blocky just and then stabby you. And, yeah. and what kind of um, fencing do you do? I know there's like foil, and what are what are the other? Epe. Epe. I do epe. Certainly the easiest weapon to deal with from a um, technological perspective, not the technique, not the, you know, the actual practice of it, but for epe, you can hit anywhere on the other person's body. You can move as fast as you want to, as slow as you want to, so long as you just make it, um, so as long as you touch the other person with the tip of your weapon. Dabby. We brought some yeah, actual exactly. sword into the sword and laser, finally. I Thank know, you it's for about that. Time. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Captain has a question. Uh, he knows you've made a choose your own adventure set in your setting, but if a AAA game developer approached you to create a game in your setting, what would your dream game be like? These books are about, uh, there's a lot of procedural and investigation elements, so an adventure game would probably be the best fit. That's one of the reasons that I like so much doing the choose your own adventure game, uh, Choice of the Deathless, getting to sort of allow characters to allow a player to walk through that kind of interactive experience. But um, some sort of more open adventure gamey kind of thing would be amazing to do. I'm thinking about um, the old LucasArts adventure games and like sort of Double Fine's adventure games mm -hmm, that they're mm -hmm. doing these days. That would be a lot of fun. That would be a lot of fun. So Captain also asks, uh, so craft is a free market capitalism and gods are the state and social services it provides, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, basically. The metaphor gets a little bit complicated as it's sort of, as the story takes off from the like initial seed, right? So the gods in addition to having all of that significance, are also gods, and they interact with their people through medium, uh, through media of faith and uh, and belief and poetry and prophecy. So, um, it departs pretty quickly from the initial uh, sort of what if. All right, we've got a couple of super questions for you to finish up with. Super uh, question, super round. Who would win in a sword fight between you and Scott Lynch? I'd also like to throw Neil Stevenson into the pile as ah. well. Oh, he's going to jump in at the, <laughs> yeah, at the last minute? He All right. also enjoys a sword. Well, Neil Stevenson would win jumping in at the last minute, you know, from behind the bush. Right, somewhere. surprise! <laughs> so, um, I, I'd bet on Scott in this one. I, I'd bet on Scott pretty seriously. Um, if it's an actual sort of sword fight in which the goal is to mangle and destroy the other person. I'm assuming it, a princess bride-like battle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hmm. The princess bride-like sort of duel is, yeah. a, is another question entirely. God, that'd be fun to do. And you're using your left hand, but Scott doesn't know it, but right. he just does <laughs> he. And... Yeah, you throw the sword up in the air, catch it, perform the... All of those moves that they talk about are real fencing moves. They're not actually the ones that they're doing at the time, but that's another <laughs> issue entirely. Um, yeah, it, oh god. Well, so it depends on Scott's weapon choice, which I haven't talked to him about that much. So mm -hmm. that'll have to be a next meeting conversation. But if he's more of a slashy guy, then I definitely have the advantage with the epee and maybe a little bit of reach on him. But if, uh, you know, if, he's, if he's more of a stabber, then it's anyone's game. Well, well, we'll he, I, he strikes me as a stabber. <laughs> Does he? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I can see that. A little bit. Um, and the final question, what are your top three reads? God, top three reads ever, all time. Sure. All right, awesome. Okay, uh, Roger Zelazny's Lord of Light. Mm. Good call. Which is amazing. Um, Dorothy Dunnett's Lyman's Chronicles, which are about the best historical fiction about a ninja Scotsman in the <laughs> mid 16th century that it is possible to conceive. <laughs> and I'm in. Yeah, oh, yeah. absolutely. The books, the one thing I have to say about the Lyman Chronicles is the writing is very dense. So a lot of people initially will sort of get about 20 pages in and bounce off. If you keep going long enough to learn um, sort of the world and understand what's going on, then it's amazing, like mind-opening, awesome experience. Does it help to have a little Lafrog too with you? Yeah, yeah, yeah that would that would help. It kind of gets you into the spirit of yeah. the thing. Um, and what else? Probably Robin McKinley's The Hero and the Crown, hmm. which I haven't read that one. It's that's awesome. It. I read it so many times when I was growing up. It's like a YA book. Um, it is about a 
princess who decides that she wants to go out and fight dragons it's sort of in her spare time and then it develops from there it's so much fun well that Fantastic. sounds that sounds right up my alley so i'll have to check that one out too max go thank for you it. thank you so much for being on the show today it's been my pleasure. Thank you very much, Veronica and Tom. Yeah, thank you, Max. Uh, his latest novel is Two Serpents Rise, and it came out October 29th, 2013. That's it, folks. If you want more Sword and Laser, there is tons. You can join our Goodreads group at goodreads.com and subscribe to the podcast, both audio and video, at swordandlaser.com. We'll see you guys next time. Bye, y'all. Bye. <laughs>